So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you coming. We've got a couple of people in the room um, and uh, we've got about 20 people that are joining us uh, on uh, online. So we're going to be speaking to both. And uh, what I really hope to, to have is a great dialogue about uh, not only our findings from the incident investigation that uh, uh, and the incident that occurred in Fernie, but also where do we go from here? Um, a few uh, quick uh, notes before we get started. The restrooms for those who are here are out the door behind us and uh, in the elevator area. You'll find the women's is uh, past the elevators and the men's is uh, before here on the right. In the event of an emergency, if the fire alarm goes off, we'll exit this door. Uh, we'll go into the elevator area uh, but we'll take the stairs and you'll be able to follow one of us down the stairs uh, uh, there. Our muster area is located behind us uh, in a large parking lot uh, over there. And we'll, we'll move as a group uh, out to that location and we'll take uh, instructions from there. Um, so let me see. So we've worked hard as a team. Uh, throughout the investigation as well, um, you know, moving into these next steps of what we do with, uh, with, with, with what we've learned. Um, the, the team, some of the team members are here uh, joining us and we're going to present uh, different portions today as a panel and uh, discuss that. Um, so uh, we'll move forward uh, uh, without going through everyone's uh, name, uh, but sorry, we've got name tags here. Um, so Janice, Carrie, um, Kelly, Alina, and Richard are joining us on stage, and we've also got Tony Scholl here, Provincial Safety Manager, to deal and help with uh, some of the questions that might arise. Um, as mentioned, we've got our investigation report that you can access online. Um, I encourage you to read it. I'm going to assume that uh, everyone joining us today, and uh, both here and online, have become familiar with aspects of that investigation. If you've not read the whole report, uh, you've read parts of it. Um, we'll, we'll highlight and, and uh, touch on some of the key areas, but what I think is really important is we move the, the conversation into uh, some of the accountabilities and some of the recommendations and next steps. Um, let's see. So, Going to move to at Technical Safety BC. Just so you can understand, for those of you who may not have worked with us uh, in the past very much, uh, Technical Safety BC, we're we're striving to be very collaborative with industry, um, and like many organizations, we we follow different operating models. Um, we've got uh, the safety pyramid that we we uh, tend to uh, leverage for our own activities uh, at Technical Safety BC starts off at the base of a lot of the processes and interactions and types of things where where we would typically involve ourselves with many of uh, our stakeholders and clients that's the permits inspections that sort of thing the goal is to move those into and make sure that we've got more participants and better connections very similar to what we're doing here today um, we're taking some of that learning and we're engaging in conversation um, the benefit is so that we can transfer and share knowledge, not just from us, but also from yourselves. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, really important uh, awareness and experience from those who work in the field that we all need to learn and share from, with the goal of really influencing our behaviors, both uh, both in, in how we manage equipment, but also how we operate, run, maintain. Um, and all of that leads to better safety. So specifically to incident investigations, the program uh, and the purpose is to really understand the causes uh, and contributing factors that lead to incidents and make sure that those are documented. And by doing so, this allows all of us to learn from uh, what, what happened and why it happened uh, so that uh, we can inform different preventative measures, whatever those might be, whether it's training, awareness, uh, procedures, uh, and in some cases, different regulatory purposes or, or uh, interpretations or activities. So. so moving on to the key findings from our investigation. We organized our investigation report uh, and we really looked at it as, a, as an activity 
in three areas, three different areas, and we had key findings in each of those three areas. So um, there was a hole in a portion of the refrigeration equipment. We'll talk about that, a small hole in the chiller. Um, it's so important with investigations that we don't uh, limit our learning and understanding from just what part broke and who touched it last. It's so important to understand uh, what were the circumstances that led to that type of failure, what environment allowed uh, certain failures to propagate. And so we, we, we were able to identify a number of management decisions uh, that led to both operation of failed equipment and, uh, and also uh, uh, some of the behaviors around the decision making in managing that equipment. Uh, thirdly, as, a, as a, we do have a number of um, areas of the equipment that we manage and, uh, and that is, is regulated that relates to ventilation and discharge systems. And even though these systems didn't directly contribute to the failure, they play an important role in the impact that certain failures may have, both on the community and on the, the facilities. So we had some key findings in that area where those systems were inadequate. This picture really shows uh, what uh, the responders and investigators first encountered in the mechanical room at the Fernie Memorial Arena. Um, what you can see here, it's a very busy picture. Um, what you can see here is there's a, this is a brine system line um, and there's an opened coupling here. Now, there's a lot of this black uh, um, substance on the floor is some of the oil and brine residue that came out of that pipe. You can see here as well some evidence of, of spray coming out of that pipe. Um, that really gave us an indication of where a breach in the overall system occurred. And we also found a not, uh, evidence of spray coming out of that from that location of the separated coupling in that brine system. So. Um, down in the bottom hand corner, you can see a bit of the legend for these photos. And it shows that there was a spray that came out and it actually, um, it actually created a lot of, uh, of, of, of movement of those contents in and around this wall where we can see spray and dripping resulting in the upper corners, um, some shadowing effects from the pipe. So it really shows the magnitude of how sudden and how strong uh, the occurrence of that release was within the room at the moment that it occurred. So as I mentioned before, um, there was a, a failure of the component, uh, the chiller, there was a small hole found in the chiller. Um, and we identified a number of contributing factors to, to why that hole uh, uh, came to be. So uh, the chiller was very quite old for its application. Uh, we found, uh, and, and in that type of use with corrosive uh, chemicals such as brine uh, uh, being used with steel, um, the age of the chiller was quite, uh, was quite old relative to, to industry standard. Um, there was some defects that uh, certain things like age will, will highlight and uh, take advantage of. And there was some weld seam defects that uh, contributed to further accelerated corrosion in certain areas of the tubing. Um, and there was also some response to a leak that had occurred the night before um, that created an isolation of both the, uh, the curling chiller uh, at the arena as well as the brine system. Um, and uh, the, the coupling itself was unsupported so that it wasn't able to retain any pressure within the system um, when pressure began to rise. So here is a, a Simple diagram of, uh, of a chiller, a shell and tube chiller that is typical of uh, what was being used at the Fernie Memorial Arena. These are quite common uh, in this application. Um, and what's important, um, and I won't describe exactly how it works, uh, but what's important is when we saw the magnitude and we understood the magnitude of what had occurred within the room, um, there was a lot of uh, speculation as to where the failure within the chiller had occurred and what was the nature of the failure. And it, most would have thought that there was a very large failure below the liquid level uh, within the chiller. And that was you know, thought to be the most likely reason how you could get such a dramatic effect within the room, how you could get such a, a large release 
and a sudden release of that uh, with such a, a devastating impact. And the reality of what we found was the opposite. We found a very small hole in the vapor section and it was located right about there uh, uh, near the return head um, uh, of the chiller and up high in one of the, the elevated tubes. So it's a very important thing to understand because those small holes in those types of, uh, in those locations are, you know, are, are a lot more common than, uh, than any sort of major failure. So it's an important learning for our industry and it's something that changes the way we have to understand those types of failures or leaks that might be occurring. And here's a picture of that actual hole. Very small. It measured across about uh, 2.6 millimeters uh, in length, and then sorry, and then across was about uh, 0.6 millimeters. So, so very, very small, and that was the only hole that we detected within the system. So, how does that small hole lead to such a devastating impact? Um, the hole here in this in this image uh, was 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 shown, even though it's shown here below the waterline. Um, the 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 small leak allowed for that ammonia leaking into the brine system to absorb into the brine system. Um, but it quickly saturated in the location around the hole. And the saturation, and we were able to detect that, that further from the chiller, the concentrations of ammonia were much lower than in areas sampled right after the incident close to the chiller. Um, so what had occurred is that saturation of the ammonia or sorry, saturation of the brine from the ammonia leaking in occurred in and around the hole. Um, and as in response to, as I mentioned the night before, in response to a leak that, at, uh, that was detected at about 4 a.m. coming out of the, the, where ammonia was, was leaking out of the brine expansion tank, um, in response to that, a number of valves were closed by the, the, the operator and the first responders to that incident. And effectively, what happened is they closed off, in order to address the leak, they closed off the brine system valves, um, effectively isolating the brine system. But they also isolated the curling chiller, knowing that there was a breach in there. So in order to protect the rest of the, the, the system. So what had occurred was this the ammonia continued to leak and, and, and be absorbed within the brine. The brine system saturated in and around the, uh, the chiller itself. And eventually that led to displacement of brine and pressure rising. Now the pressure rising in this system, as, as most understand the brine systems are not necessarily designed to be pressure retaining systems. So eventually it found the weakest part and that weakest part happened to be this coupling uh, that was located within the mechanical room that was unsupported and eventually it separated. Um, and upon separation, um, the, the brine that was absorbed, or sorry, the ammonia that was absorbed within the brine, uh, as well as whatever ammonia was within the system, quickly evaporated into the, the, the space of the mechanical room and uh, overcame those, uh, those who were within the room. We did uh, simulate and estimate uh, the, amount, the concentration of ammonia that, uh, that it may have reached within the room. Uh, and we estimated it, that it exceeded 20,000 parts per million, which is quite excessive. So as I mentioned before, it's so important not to just look at the parts that failed and, and how they were touched last in order to really understand how an, an incident unfolds. We did find that there was a number of, uh, of operational decisions that contributed very much so to this incident occurring. So throughout, there was insufficient hazard awareness relating to leaking chillers and aging equipment. Um, predominance of operation and run to failure uh, was within industry. We often found, uh, we found here and we also found in industry that uh, the end of life strategies for many components within a maintenance plan uh, aren't part of that maintenance plan. So people aren't necessarily planning for those sorts of, sorts of large expenses. Um, they, they, they come about due to failures. Um, there was also employee turnover and a number of competing organizational priorities that contributed to some of the decision-making that left this aging chiller in continued operation. Um, and also its use after a failure was detected. 
So if we look at the timeline, uh, we went all the way back and we discovered that um, in late 2010, there was a recommendation by the maintenance contractor to replace that chiller due to its age. Uh, that recommendation was made and there was a, uh, a, a scheduling for, for the finances to support that replacement. That was planned for 2013, and then it was moved into 2014, um, but then it was subsequently deleted from any of the financial plans. Um, so the activity didn't happen. And we saw this uh, year over year where the chiller was, was identified as a potential item to be, to be addressed, but it wasn't. Um, a failure of the chiller was detected during the shutdown period in the spring of 2017. So ammonia was found within the brine system and through discussions between the maintenance contractor and the operator, um, there was a decision made to monitor the failed chiller, which led to the day before the incident occurred, which led to a decision to then operate the chiller. It was shut down at that period. Um, and following the event of, that happened the, the night before, uh, where there was leaking through the brine expansion tank and the, which led to the isolation of the chiller and brine system through closing of those valves. So it's really important as a maintenance contractor community to understand how clear your recommendations are for replacement, what are the consequences that could occur. It's also very important to understand that when um, <coughs> operators are making decisions around, um, around failed equipment that they understand um, you know, clearly the nature of the equipment that they, they might have uh, with them, they're relying upon you for clear advice and clear direction in many cases. So as I mentioned before, we also looked at ventilation systems and discharge systems as part of this, this event and the role that they played. Uh, we did a very simple test, a smoke test, where we, we ignited a smoke candle. They're very, it's a very straightforward thing to do and it's not expensive. We ignited it within the mechanical room and we just watched and recorded how, how the smoke was evacuated from the room and where it went outside of the building. What we found, oops, sorry about that. Let me go back. What we found was that there was a recessed area between the arena, which is was over here, and the curling system and the predominant winds uh, an air movement in that area moved across those roofs and it created this little recessed pocket where the smoke coming out of the ventilation system simply hung around and it got stuck. It didn't get taken away by, by the airflow and it eventually started, we could see it curling around to the front of the building and this location right here is an inlet for the HVAC system. So we did measure and the first responders uh, did measure 400 parts per million in the arena lobby after the event. The other thing that we noticed was that the small fan, there was two fans here, a large fan that was installed for leak uh, rupture scenarios, as well as a small fan here. And the small fan was evacuating all of the smoke, but in this pocket, it just drifted over toward this inlet on the arena side. Um, so we could see evidence of it just drifting over and going toward an air inlet of some type on the arena side. Um, so it's very important to understand the air movements when you're trying to evacuate something that you don't bring it right back into the building. Inside the room, what we found was here's the, this image shows you the small fan that is always running and then the large fan that's installed for leak rupture scenarios. So when there is an ammonia leak, it comes on. This large fan was installed directly within the established airflow. So it effectively did nothing to help evacuate the room. And that's exactly what we saw on the roof is that this did nothing. Um, there was a, an area uh, of, of smoke accumulation along this wall where you could see that it's, it's outside of the established airflow. And what's important about this is that this accumulated smoke was right next to the vestibule door and that would be the normal entry area in response uh, to, to an ammonia leak. Um, the graph that's important to understand on the side shows estimates of the, the, the concentration rise that had occurred um, going above 20,000 parts per million and estimates of, of how quickly that was ventilated out of the room. 
And you can see that in the configuration that we encountered, what that means is that when, you, when there's such ineffective ventilation within the room, the room stays at very high concentrations for a much longer period of time, which exposes anyone who may have been caught within the room. And, uh, and some, of the, uh, some of the people that were in the room, the deceased, were actually discovered in this area. So, as I mentioned before, there were a number of things, even though the ventilation system didn't directly contribute to the failure, it's so important that they're, that they're considered um, to be working properly and performing their functions that they're intended to do. And we found a number of areas where they, uh, where they, were, they were deficient. So uh, these are opportunities for us to improve moving forward. So as I mentioned before, um, in a few comments, um, while we were investigating this incident, our teams were also out there in the field doing inspections and assessments of other facilities and also collecting information and discussing uh, with various industry parties. And what we found was that the situation that, was un that had unfolded at Fernie was very common or, or it wasn't uncommon uh, in other arenas, in other areas. We found um, in, in obtaining uh, evidence from ammonia or brine system uh, uh, brine uh, analysis that looks for ammonia within the brine, we found 26 instances of arenas within the three years prior to Fernie actually containing ammonia within, uh, within their brine system. So leaking chillers were occurring within industry. Uh, many arenas were not conducting brine testing or analysis, so many people just were not aware that they may have had failures occurring within their systems until it showed up in a different way. Uh, we also found that uh, uh, there was a predominance of a, of, of a lack of awareness of how a small leak um, could be very hazardous. Um, we also found that there was a, a, you know, in many circumstances, there was a preference to continue to operate a leaking chiller or, or a system where uh, a leaking chiller ought to have been suspected and been under investigation. So both from the maintenance contractors as well as from the owners. So, while there was a few instances where um, our teams had to shut down those operations, there was a number as well. I, I, I need to note that uh, where the sites recognized the hazard that they that they had and shut down. Um, so these are things that we need to learn as an industry and start to treat differently, um, given what's happened. And now I'm going to pass the conversation to Janice Lee. Thanks, Jeff. I'm Janice Lee, the Director of Safety Oversight. And um, before we get into the 18 recommendations, and of course, the recommendations are going to be targeted uh, for the contractors and refrigeration mechanics, I do want to go through accountabilities and responsibilities. I think that's important to set that foundation so everybody understands what role they play. Wrong direction. So we believe at Technical Safety BC that safety is a shared responsibility. So this is really the triangle of the players really in any operation of equipment. I mean, owners, in this case, we're talking about ice rink owners or even plant owners, um, in terms of they're the ones who actually own and manage the equipment. And so they're, they're the ones who are hiring the operators, uh, making sure that they are uh, the correct uh, supervision levels that they're working within the scope of work and of course they're engaging with the technical specialists and we're talking about special technical specialists talking about the contractors the refrigeration mechanics and they're the ones who are actually really performing the regular work um, and it's important that they perform it within the scope of the regular work um, and there a lot of the things they're doing um, within the context of fernie when we think about what jeff talked about a lot of us around the communication really what was the communication between all three parties um, how well were hazards or the safe operation of the equipment well understood? Um, and how was that information channeled through the various levels within those organizations? So those are things I would like, you know, you to think about. So when we think about looking at the safe operation of a site, you know, as the contractor or refrigeration mechanic, do you know the procedures with, with dealing with hazards? Uh, and unfortunately, with for any what we found with the investigation is that, um, you know, they wind up actually, you know, over pressurizing uh, the actual system itself. And so where are those procedures to deal with those situations? Um, in terms of communication, if there's 
a safety issue identified on site, how, as a contractor or refrigeration mechanic, are you bringing those to the owners? Um, are you presenting in a way that's clearly understood? Um, as we know, a lot of times the owners may be thinking about you know, keeping the ice going. Uh, we want to maintain the schedule, peewee hockey, et cetera. And when you say that there is a recommendation to actually repair parts or perhaps to temporarily shut down a unit, do they actually understand the rationale behind it from a sense of, from a safety perspective? And how are you presenting in that way? And last but not least is, what happens if the owner doesn't take your advice? And you know yourself, there's an unsafe situation. What is your recourse? Um, and so those are a lot of things around accountability and responsibility that, that we want you to start thinking about. You know, I, I think a lot of times we're, we're there on the job thinking about trying to just maintain the equipment, keep the owners happy, there's a contractual obligation, but the name of the game is really about safety and we need to ensure that there's safe operation of the equipment. Um, and when it comes down to those things, it's really paramount that communication is central and in the case where perhaps an owner is actually not responding to a recommendation that is related to safety, we need you guys to actually re report it to our ourselves. So I think one of the myths that I want to clear up is a lot of times um, from a technical safety BC perspective, um, owners or even contractors are under the impression that only incidents have to be reported. And really hazards is also something that actually needs to be reported as well. Um, so it is an easy process. We, we do have two avenues to do that. One is through our Technical Safety BC website, uh, which you can categorize into is it an incident versus a hazard, or you can actually call our contact center. And so I do want to bring this to everybody's attention because this is really important. Because um, not only have we learned a lot about um, findings from the incident investigation, but hazards is also for us a way to learn. And this is a, for us an ability to actually understand the information, what's actually happening out to industry and pushing it back out. Um, so with that, I'm actually going to turn it over um, to Carrie, who's the regional business leader for the interior, and she's going to launch into uh, one of the recommendations. Thanks, Janice. So I, I'm Carrie Hughes. I'm the regional business leader for the interior, and I am going to speak to you today with regards to um, having clear instructions and procedures that uh, in the event that there is an incident, uh, that you're well prepared in order to address that incident. Uh, so ammonia detection in the brine is evidence of a possible leaking chiller. It does indicate that there is a hazard um, and, and they can be quite hazardous to people as, uh, as pointed out by this uh, investigation. So be prepared in that event. Um, there, if you go into a site and ask what their procedures are, how do you actually uh, respond to having an incident? Uh, who should you be phoning? Uh, who is doing what action? And who do you need to notify? Um, have telephone numbers for those key people and external companies ready and current. Um, and, and if you can, do a practice run, do a dry run at least once a year and make sure that it's running effectively. And ensure that you're notifying Technical Safety BC of a leak. Uh, these, as a regional business leader, um, the safety officers do go out, they, they do respond to those, they, they would like to know that uh, if there are incidents happening and they will work with the teams in order to help you out. Um, there is a zero tolerance for leaks in chillers. So if there is a leak in the chiller, pull it out of service right away. Make sure that you are uh, doing an investigation, finding where that leak is coming from, mitigate that uh, through maintenance and repairs and at, it's at that point that you can then put it back into service once that it has been done. So, and the asset owner and the employees need to be fully involved. Uh, they cannot discharge the duty down to the contractor. So they need to be involved all the way along through that process. And the next slide speaks to the implementation of training um, and procedures for the refrigeration system managers. So know who has what technical knowledge and who you can draw on in order to help you make better decisions. Um, each, uh, whether it be the refrigeration operator, operator the mechanic, uh, if you need to bring in external 
a professional engineer, fourth class power engineer, do so, but understand what the context of their level of knowledge is and understand how you can draw on that knowledge in order to make those better decisions. Now I'm going to pass it along to my colleague, Kelly Moon. Okay, I'm going to speak with you about recommendation number two from the um, incident investigation report. And this one is also um, targeted at asset owners, but maintenance contractors, refrigeration maintenance contractors have a role to play. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm going to speak with you a little bit about what we found um, when we were reviewing not only the Fernie Memorial um, Arena, but other ice arenas, because it became apparent that um, owners and operators will take different approaches to uh, their maintenance program and typically they will fall into one of the categories <coughs> on the right hand side of the screen there. So they will take a corrective approach which means they repair things as they find them. They may take a preventative approach to maintenance based on a predetermined schedule. They could do predictive maintenance which um, means that they would um, attempt to predict failures through regular assessment and then they could do sort of a reliability centered approach which would mean that calculating the risk levels and making decisions um, about repairs based on that and what we're encouraging you to do and we might be able to speak about this a little bit more together after when we're in the question period but just think about this as we're as we're um, as we're going through the recommendations what strategies have you seen owners and operators employ when you, uh, with the people that you've been working with in the various facilities and the ice arenas, and what would be ideal? Is it a mix? Is it just taking one of these approaches? And what kind of influence can you have in the maintenance program? Because the expertise often lies with the refrigeration uh, maintenance contractors. And um, we actually met with asset owners and operators last week, and I'll share with you a little bit about what they told us about what they need from you. Most importantly, what recommendation number two speaks to is the need for owners to think beyond maintenance. So we need to um, influence them to think more about the full life cycle of their equipment, which includes equipment aging out. So um, they, they're relying on you for expertise around that. And here's what they told us is really helpful. They told us that early warning is very helpful. When they need to lobby for resources, whether they are financial or labor, they, they need the, the earlier that you can indicate that there's a problem, the, the better that that is for them for planning. They also said that it's helpful when you bring compliance into the conversation. So if you can influence them with um, regulatory information that, that there is an obligation to take care of this equipment in a certain way, and if you can really explain the risks, which I think a couple of my colleagues were, were speaking about, they said they actually need to know, they just don't understand sometimes what's actually happening with their equipment. And I'll actually talk a little bit more about that as we go to the next slide. Oh, goodness. Is anybody's guess which direction? There we go, got it. Um, <clears throat> so this one, this recommendation number eight is actually aimed uh, directly at maintenance contractors. So this one is for yourselves and um, I'm sure that you're aware of the information bulletin on incident and hazard reporting. Um, if you're not, Please be familiar with it, ensure that the um, asset owners and operators that you're working with at the facilities, the engineers and all of the people in your circle are familiar with it. And um, basically it outlines some of, of the responsibilities that you have and the role that you play around incident and hazard reporting. So you're obligated to report all incidents and hazards and manage the hazards through repair and replacement as needed. Um, if there's a concern, you need to document this. And documentation is interesting. Um, there are a few things to think about in your documentation. Is the language too technical? You're often communicating with people who are non-technical. So how, 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 um, what can you do to make your language as clear and plain as possible? Are the risks outlined clearly? So is it just about this thing's not working, but, there, but there's not sort of a follow-up conversation about risk? 
Um, non-compliance, so add compliance to the conversation, outline them, outline the non-compliances that might exist within that hazard that you're trying to communicate. Um, also, is it a line item on an invoice or is it a full explanation? So asset owners and operators are telling us, you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's one line, it's really technical, I don't really understand what it's about. So they're, they're asking for more. Um, and also clearly define that reporting relationship. Is the person that you're communicating your findings um, with, are they the right person? Do you know that it's actually going to channel up to the um, ICE facility owners and operators? And follow up. So if, if um, you've identified a hazard and you don't know what's what's happened with it make sure that you follow up so that you know um, that steps are being taken to to deal with that hazard um, sometimes a contractor sometimes um, contractors yourselves maintenance people might actually need to um, call in other expertise to deal with uh, an as found condition so if, if you're not qualified to fully diagnose or solve the problem um, you know, please take the next step to to get some to get more uh, involvement and advice as needed. Um, and the responsibilities around uh, recommending whether or not a piece of equipment remains in operation, as you saw with this incident, it, it really does fall to you. And um, it's it. Uh, um, communicating clearly with the asset owner about whether something should continue to operate is really important. Um, so basically, if reasonable actions are not being taken um, after reporting hazards to the asset owner, then as Janice was saying, you do have recourse. You can report it to us. We encourage you to report it to us and we can provide support. And basically what I'll leave you with um, just to think about as we get towards the end of our session is how have you managed to successfully communicate hazards? So there might have been situations where you um, felt like you, you needed to have more influence, but there might be other situations where you were able to influence effectively. Please share that with the group. We'd really like to hear about it and learn from it because that's what we're trying to do in our next steps is make sure that hazards can be communicated effectively. Thank you, and I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Alina. The other way. The other way? Down. Down? Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Alina Uloyo, and I'm the Programs Manager for Safety Oversight. So uh, this recommendation is meant specifically for training providers. And it's really meant to address knowledge gaps at the curriculum level uh, for training and apprenticeship programs uh, for a number of individuals uh, that actually either perf uh, perform regulated work, um, you know, in terms of installing and servicing or the operation of that equipment. So specifically um, for refrigeration operators, refrigeration mechanics and fourth class power engineers. So those are the specific individuals and the, the programs that we're targeting right now. So during the investigation, um, we actually review the training materials for minimum technical qualifications associated with uh, refrigeration systems, which indicated that maintenance uh, training content did not include component wear out end of life uh, or condition assessment considerations. So everyone's been talking uh, about sort of the whole life cycle and we're not necessarily uh, preparing all the individuals who are going to perform all these uh, important safety um, uh, tasks in the industry we're not preparing them to actually deal with those types of situations and support both contractors as well as asset owners in managing their assets uh, the other thing that we'd like to um, sort of address through that, we also noticed that Brian testing analysis and interpretation isn't necessarily covered in the curriculum, as well as um, emergency situational guidance. So what do you do in, in a situation of emergency? Do you actually know and understand how to perform a proper risk assessment when you're faced with an emergency? And um, can you make good decisions around um, how to operate, uh, for example, the, uh, an emergency discharge system, which in this situation, um, you know, didn't, it didn't help um, being operated. 
So those are all things that we'd like to actually see improve within the existing curriculums. So um, one of one of the strategies is quite obvious that we're uh, we're going to have to engage both uh, training providers as well as industry training authority and the industry itself in actually looking at all these gaps and seeing how can we actually improve all these training and apprenticeship programs. So that's an important uh, aspect because it supports uh, future um, our future workforce and kind of industry um, it shaping the industry for the future. But we all realize that we're still going to continue to have a gap in terms of knowledge of our existing workforce. So the question out there is, how are we, how are we going to address that gap? Um, what can we do uh, as training providers, as contractors, as asset owners? How can we actually close the gaps within our existing workforce? Um, and we're looking and we're going to be seeking solutions and working collaboratively um, with everyone that plays a role in that knowledge space to actually help support closing the gap. Um, what we're realizing that training isn't a one time event. So um, training needs to be maintained um, it needs to, and it needs to address some of these knowledge gaps as we identify them and we experience events such as this, hopefully not to the extent that this one happened, but on an ongoing basis as we um, identify hazards and we start learning from them, how do we actually close the gaps, the knowledge gaps that our industry ha has um, to support a safer um, operation of, of, this, uh, of this type of equipment. So though I'm gonna leave that with you, um, we're looking for solutions and we're going to be uh, seeking lots of engagement um, and working collaboratively with any, everyone to actually, um, you know, improve safety overall and the training for uh, all qualified individuals. I'm going to pass it to Richard now to talk about um, Good morning, everyone. I'm Richard Miller. I'm a product leader here at Technical Safety BC. And this recommendation is related to Jeff's presentation around findings that we had in, in Fernie about ventilation. This recommendation is that we recommend that arena owners conduct an assessment and test of ventilation systems in all their arenas. So this test needs to evaluate the ventilation and the external discharge from the mechanical room. And it really needs to demonstrate that the system is minimizing the risk of exposure, both for staff and the public. And arena owners are, will be requesting this test. There be, we're recommending that they do so. And as contractors mechanics, you'll likely be required to perform uh, these tests on the ventilation systems. Uh, we recommend that this test be done on a regular basis. Uh, could be quarterly, could be annually. But it also needs to be done whenever there's been any kind of renovation work, construction, equipment upgrading, or any other building changes that may influence the flow of air and the ventilation within the facility. So this test, as Jeff mentioned, can be conducted easily and quite cost effectively. Uh, one can get a smoke candle and test it, light the smoke candle, watch where the air goes and sees what happens. As contractors and mechanics, um, it's up to you to recommend if, if the tests prove that the ventilation system is not working adequately and is not um, ventilating the building, uh, you need to be recommending changes and discuss with the asset owner, with the owner of the arena, what to do and how to improve the ventilation system. So if there is an incident, it will not be compounded by having uh, flow of gases into uh, enclosed areas. Now, let me pass it back to Jess. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. So next steps. Um, so again, we didn't go through 18 recommendations. Those are all available on the website. Uh, we wanted to talk about uh, the recommendations. We felt that as maintenance contractors and refrigeration mechanics that we've been pertinent to you. Uh, in terms of next steps, um, Technical Safety BC is very committed to 
see the 18 recommendations uh, to be appropriately implemented. But part of that implementation really is where we actually need help. Um, as you see with the discussions with some of these recommendations, um, we're talking about high level solutions, but we need to know the specifics. I mean, for um, the group here, as well as asset owners, you know what the specific needs are. Where are some of those challenges? Where are the things that we can actually provide support in? And so as Alina and others have talked about, uh, we are gonna be forming working groups. And this is where we would ask that um, you'd be available to assist us with some of these working groups or even have ideas that you think we should pursue that would help us with some of these solutions. Because um, as, as you can see, some of these solutions are long-term. They are gonna take some time to oversee and recommend. And, and some of them are very much about influencing the appropriate people to get things done. We're very committed to doing that. So we are looking for your ideas and support. Um, and with those recommendations and, and when they became into actual uh, strategies, um, some of those tactics will be could be more around education. It could even perhaps be lar larger regulatory change, but we're not ready to even go there yet until we actually have a good plan to go forward. So please ex expect to see that we'll be reaching out for further engagement and uh, further uh, working groups and rollout in uh, 2019. Um, and last but not least, I, I do want to talk about that. Um, you know, as everybody knows, we actually have been actively going out conducting assessments uh, with ice rinks and marinas, and we're obviously going to continue doing that. We are going to be expanding beyond that, and in terms of the other uh, ammonia refrigeration plants in the province, uh, one of the things that we developed, what we thought would be helpful, uh, is first we did it for our own internal purposes around training or, of our safety officers. Uh, when conducting assessments for more of a consistency perspective. So we created what we call assessment checklists, but what we thought would be really helpful is as contractors, owners, refrigeration mechanics, you're aware of what we're looking at and what we will be looking for when we come on site. So those will be available on our website. And I believe um, those who have signed up um, for the webinars themselves will be also sent a copy of these assessments. I think so that's a great foundation that we can all have a good discussion on. And like I said, we are totally committed to implementing these 18 recommendations. And what I do want to leave with, with you today is with all the discussions today around the findings and some of the learnings, what are you going to do differently? What are you going to take back to your organization? Uh, what is percolating within your head about, wow, like we actually have a gap here. This is something that we need to take back and talk about and put some plans together on. So. I leave that with you and I'm actually going to open it up uh, to questions and discussions and I have my colleagues here to also support me in those answers. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> actually, I forgot one more thing. Um, so we are here to help. Um, so we do actually have, uh, obviously, Carrie talked about, we have uh, local boiler safety officers uh, who obviously, uh, many of you who are refrigeration contractors as well as um, mechanics have reached out to them. Uh, we have regional business studios spread around the province and um, please feel free to connect with them um, as one of your primary contacts uh, to connect with us. And now we'll go to questions. Okay, uh, so if there's anybody online, please feel free to <coughs> type your questions in. No one yet, we have a few minutes. Okay. Questions, discussions, ideas? I have a question. So when you talk about ventilation and that being a recommendation that, that um, owners do an assessment, at, uh, why are we not making that mandatory? Do we not have the right, obviously, we have arenas out there that, that aren't compliant with the 52. Um, why is that only a recommendation? Um, I think it's important that after, um, after an incident, and normally we put recommendations as a result of a report, uh, because there might be many ways to achieve the same res or to achieve a positive result. Um, so in terms of uh, you know what's required or how we interpret some of the rules, that might change. But what we don't want to do is exclude this period of time where we have a good, healthy dialogue with those 
people in industry to uh, and those contractors and owners to figure out what is the best way to actually motivate some of these changes. We also, having not done a large number of, of and seen the results of some of the ventilation testing, there might be other things that we need to consider. So it's important that the first step out of an investigation is to recommend and to try to initiate change in a different direction and uh, uh, but to engage everybody else. So, so whether or not that comes into um, a, if, if a rule change or something down the road is the best way to address it from what we're able to learn in this evaluation period, then that's great. But it's so important that we, we make sure that there's a really good healthy space for dialogue and engagement with everyone. So that's why we start with recommendations. Um, I'm not sure where, where, where these will go. Question further on that. I mean, it says to inspect or to look at these ventilation sites. Many of them meet B52, but what we're talking about is effectiveness. Yep. So some criteria on what is effective and how that pass or fails to, to send my guys out and say, I want you to do a smoke test. Won't do any good unless there's pass or fail criteria. Yeah, right. It's very subjective right now that you need to watch the smoke, which is not necessarily representative, but would, I mean, if it gets sucked into a fresh air thing four feet away, anybody should see that. We're also crossing, I don't know if it's disciplines. These are refrigeration mechanics, not ventilation specialists. So a lot of what I heard in the last little bit sounded more like offloading on the contractor than it was getting the contractor to be cooperative or it's the asset owner that owns this stuff and he's responsible for it and a whole bunch of this is you guys need to do this you guys need to do that what we need from the asset owner is who's responsible for their plant and who gets those recommendations rather than asking the contractor to find out who that needs to be every one of those plants should be should who's responsible for the safety of their plant and they're the people to get the recommendation from us as contractors and get to deal with it. And then we've done our part. But if we give our recommendation to finance on a work order or to the operator that's down on the floor, if he doesn't have enough bite, it's not going to be effective. I, there's a there's a lot in there. I don't know, Janice, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's a lot in there, Blair. So I mean. So I do start off with safety is a shared responsibility. You're right that it is the owner's plant or the owner representative's plant, but as technical folks, um, they are looking for advice. So a lot of times they are trying to understand what is the technical issue, what's the safety issue, what are those operational issues? Um, and you're there to help them make recommendations. Absolutely in the end, they are the decision makers. Um, but I think what Jeff was also talking about within that Fernie investigation, sometimes those communication channels, the understanding of, you know, what is it that you're proposing to me? So a lot of times when we talk to owners, they're like, well, we don't know if you just want to sell us something. Is it about safety? Is it about efficiency? What is it about? Having them designate a person that's responsible for the safety in their plant would help contractors because I don't know if I'm contacting the city of Surrey when we send out our bills, the operator, as far as we understood, the operator's in charge of the plant. He's the guy responsible for the safety in that plant. That's our contact right now. If there needs to be somebody else from those facilities, that needs to be, that should be maybe a recommendation from BCSA is okay for this group of facilities. Who is the safety person responsible for this stuff? Because we give it to the, the chief of the plant and our job is done. I mean, we, I don't know how many, right, and I don't mean to pick on a specific municipality or whatever, sure. but how many people would be involved in the city of Surrey and operating the arenas? And then each arena would have its own chief or person responsible that you would, we expect, has care and control of that plant. For us to go further up the food chain, there's just not enough time in the day. I could hire three more people, and it would be non, it, uh, right? It would be a non-paid position. It's like we're game to do all of our part for safety, but uh, we also need to turn a profit at the end of the day. And if they're not paying for it, much like um, even one of those said that if uh, they need further inspection, we should be calling the people out. Without a PO, I can't call anybody out. 
So I'm, I'm finding this very helpful. Thank you. I'm working on strategies around recommendation number eight. So I'd really like to talk with you more. Can we exchange contact information sure. please sure. at the end? Because some of the things that you're talking about, I'd like to be able to consider them within um, some of the actions that- I guess my last point, I mean, working groups are great, but there's so much going on right now. There really needs to be a more formal group. There should be a refrigeration subcommittee that this is working through and the working groups go back to. So you've got some cohesiveness and some industry in there and that refrigeration subcommittee be made up of end users and contractors so that they can help you guys that what's work, what's going to, I mean, well, um, there's no limit to the amount of money anybody's going to spend on safety to make it, to make a difference, to save a life. But let's make sure that we're spending it on that's going to make a difference and not stuff that's just window dressing, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. Yeah, totally. Right? Agree, we, we, want, yeah. we want rubber to hit the road. Yeah, no, and we agree. And it's, it's um, I mean, the whole reason we're presenting the recommendations is it's obviously directed at everybody within that responsibility triangle, right? So what we're trying to promote is that, is there a common understanding around accountabilities or even you know the fact that people need to communicate because it is complex like to your point there's no one size fits all different organizations have different structures um, and what we're trying to promote is that at least a common understanding and kind of like huh what don't i know and what kind of questions should i be it the owner chief operator you know your group who who should be talking and what are what are some of those gaps um, and we also want to be able to support that and say, okay, where do we need to target to actually bring that level of understanding greater? And so that we want people to make the right decisions at the right time. And I think that's what we, we all do. want. We yeah. all do. So thank you. And uh, was there people on the phone? Yes. We have an online comment from uh, Dave and Jamie. Um, they enjoy the content and they say, what we see is a lack of motivation from owners not to comply with compliance of the B-52 as well. End of life is the decision criteria for equipment replacement. We do not have ammonia here, but still service about 750 tons of cooling in our facility. The owners do not recognize B-52 or the need to comply. And then they added a second part that said, um, the ventilation aspect is another misunderstood aspect of the HVAC umbrella and another system component that is left alone, modified without proper planning, and is forgot about until there is an issue. Okay, quite a number of points in there. Uh, we can try to unpack that a little bit. Um, so first, thanks for participating and enjoying our content. Um, so, uh, so I'm obviously a little concerned if there's uh, compliance issues and I'm not sure what the extent is and again this is kind of where we would appreciate from a hazard reporting or, or if you'd like to remain perhaps a little more confidential to connect with our local boiler safety officer um, so that you know we can actually go and conduct an assessment to understand what is actually going on in that specific site. Um, the third piece about ventilation um, I guess I'm not totally sure is it kind of what Blair was talking about the the pass no go or 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 we can also take that offline if there's a specific question about ventilation that we can try to, to understand. I think, yeah, uh, if you want to add yeah, to I that. think what I what I hear in that comment is is a, a lot of similar sentiment where what we're trying to do is increase the engagement of, of ownership, you know, with with uh, with with aspects, important aspects of the equipment. Um, you know, I think as, as things operate into an aging environment, you know, successful performance yesterday is no longer a, a good measure of how it will perform tomorrow. And how do we get, how do we, how do we start to change and engage others who may not have a technical awareness or background into that, uh, into that sphere of certain things are going, certain thinking, certain attitudes toward equipment are going to have to change. Um, and I think it's also on, you know, speaking to some of the ventilation comments and, and, uh, and Blair, to, you, to your comments around, um, you know, pass-fail criteria being an important part of inspection. Um, one of the things that, that I notice in a lot of the codes and rules and a lot of the actions and tasks is um, we often don't provide, we don't, we don't provide a lot of space for critical thinking. 
And some of these, and I think the rules today are, you know, in a, an effective manner or something that doesn't create risk. That's a very challenging thing sometimes to judge in the moment. And sometimes with pass fight and fail criteria, the response is that things just aren't questioned and they aren't done. And uh, the simple thing of lighting off a, a smoke candle and just watching where it goes creates, in some cases, very obvious results where it's going right into an inlet. Well, you know, that might obviously translate into a, a simple pass fail criteria, but sometimes it's worth actually thinking about some of these broad rules and and challenging ourselves on to, and to, and to whether or not we understand that. And I agree where it makes sense. We should be creating some, you know, straightforward pass fail criteria, but I think we also don't want to limit the critical thinking that's so important to happen in the field that people are actually thinking about the objectives of some of these things not just pass fail criteria because sometimes pass fail criteria isn't enough um, you know a lot of the times we see ventilation requirements translated into straight line distance which doesn't help if there's airflow but you know it, it, there's a lot of variables to consider so we need people to think about objectives too and and uh, engage in that but it, it certainly is a something to think hard about and, and get people to step in to be more curious about some of some of their systems so um, for sure but i think from like whether we do best practices gets a little tricky because then that becomes an enforcement issue yeah. but some installation guidelines i know we're we're focusing on the picture they're showing <coughs> uh the ventilation not getting part of the room mm -hmm. one of the if um as industry and regulators we came up with some guidelines on what to look at when they're building this plan because yeah. trying to change it after the fact one of the other things and i got caught in that same thing uh with an architect at one of the sites there because we couldn't put our exhaust fan where we wanted to and it's like it mirrored very closely to what you had there the one thing i found out afterwards though is i'm sucking the air towards the door and towards the vestibule instead of the other way around and that Right. We want the fresh air coming near where the guys are entering the room mm -hmm. and we want to try and exhaust away from them. So we give them a safe entrance into that space too. that sort of guidelines or a practical guide. Uh, they won't necessarily pass fail. I'm a little afraid of too, because I mean, so the guys get seven out of 10 things and we tell them it's not good enough. And it's like, well, right. It, it's pretty good. We're looking mainly with the ventilation to keep that room from getting to an explosive level that was never meant for a health and safety item. It gets used for that and it, for sure, right? I mean, I'd like to see exhaust fans that are twice as big as what they are today, just because it allows my guys to go fix a problem before it becomes a hazmat problem. But the, the root goal in, B, in B52 was not people, it was to keep the room from exploding. Um, so some, some, they probably all meet that root goal it's just there's other side effects from that, or most of them do now. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah, so Tony, for those of you online, uh, it's Tony Schull, Prevention Safety Manager for Boilers. A couple of comments. These are great questions. A um, couple of comments I would have is this, the ventilation situation has been, or that recommendation has been forwarded to CSA B52, the technical code committee. A working group has been put together and they'll be looking at all of these questions. So part of it would be expectations. Is it um, what Blair said is, is true? Initially, it seems to be that it was the ventilation requirements are largely based around explosion protection and the rating of electrical devices. Um, not necessarily, in t or actually not intended for the safety of persons in the, in, the, in, a, in the case of a leak. So for example, if you have whatever you could define a major leak as, how fast does your ventilation system exhaust that? How quick does the ammonia enter? And so this is where WorkSafe BC requirements also sort of overlap because they, they, have, they have regulations that touch on ventilation that specifically are around worker protection. And they have, you know, this is in the future, this could be married up in case to be a ventilation that's identified to serve a certain purpose. And we could have aging facilities built to earlier codes, acceptance criteria, a starting point could be, does it meet the initial design? If that's available, how will that be changed in the future? So all of those are big questions and how, 
you know, how do you put an effective overall safety program in place so that your ventilation, your detectors, your hazard assessment, your emergency procedures that allow or restrict entry into a, a, a space that's known to have ammonia, all of those things really need to work together, but there's a lot of questions. The acceptance criteria is a difficult one. Uh, my last comment I would say is we all, we do need to keep in mind that regulations and adopted codes um, generally and typically provide a minimum level, minimum level of prescriptive requirements. And, and we can say for B52, which covers all types of refrigerants, all installations, we do have specific ru uh, rules for class T machine rooms, but it most likely does not take into account all considerations, adjoining building structures, building codes, where you can uh, put, locate your ventilation equipment, especially in existing buildings. So those are all questions, but, um, you know, I, I would also like to say that in the last 30 years, the majority of, of serious injuries caused by ammonia have occurred in one place, and that's inside the machine room. So. Online. We have a couple of questions online. Um, the first one we may have already answered, but I'll ask anyway. Um, Steve says these recommendations are great. There seems to be some confusion as to the refrigeration trade complying to B52, as well as these recommendations. Which one has precedent when offering solutions to the owners of the equipment? They're all important, so I, I, I don't think there's really a a precedent in terms of priority. I mean, the reason why there's 18 is because all 18 of them are important. Um, yeah, so I don't, yeah, if there's a specific they question seem about to be a, saying that B52 um, versus the recommendations, that there might be a precedent over one or the other of those is how I'm kind of reading the question. Um, I'm, I'm only assuming, I'm, so obviously, as Tony talked about, the code is obviously always um under review and there's different subcommittees working on it and it's a minimum standard and so the intent is there are basically three recommendations that's directed um, at csa and that because um, we do want to move ahead where you know we, we feel like we've identified uh, some gaps that we think there are necessary improvements and so hence um, moving in that direction and obviously one of them is around ventilation yeah so and I'm just thinking about all of the different recommendations. Nothing jumps to my mind where there's a conflict. I think what we've identified is a number of areas where the current rules may not actually serve the intended purpose, or or there's a or there's a there's a gap where there's a hazard that we've identified that may not be sufficiently addressed in rule. But I'm not aware of where there's a conflict. So I don't think I think uh, first and foremost, compliance is a requirement. So. So there's no there's no uh, discussion about complying with B52. It has to happen, um, and the recommendations really supplement areas where um, that might not be sufficient, um, and and further thought might be needed, and we might see further down the road what uh, what comes as 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 a best way to address some of those gaps. So if there is a belief that there's a conflict specifically between one of the recommendations or how it's being interpreted and uh, what is currently required, please let us know because we really do want to make sure that uh, that, that gets sorted out. And from someone else, um, they also enjoyed the presentation and would like to know if Technical Safety BC would consider implementing mandatory reporting requirements if recommendations are being followed. For example, reporting brine or ammonia contamination reporting annual ventilation test results etc so i mean currently we did issue a safety order the year before around mandatory brine testing and reporting to us i think that's one of the safety orders will be under review um, i think there's a couple of things one is um, we do expect requirements in the code and any future regulatory changes to be followed it is really the owner's responsibility um, and as to does it actually have to be sent to us, that's a question mark. I mean, in terms of is that useful or is it the fact that we actually care that it's being done um, and that when our safety officers go on site, they actually have access to records and have a, can have a dialogue about it. So, I mean, we're, we're open. 
Um, but again, it is really around uh, where the owner is responsible for ensuring um, code and regulations are being followed. And, and for them, it's, it's really, they should be keeping their own records. Um, you know, we did that as an exceptional circumstance because after the Fernie incident, as Jeff talked about, we did identify there was a number of sites that weren't even testing, um, you know, their brine system to get under, you know, and obviously that is one of the leading indicators. Um, so that's why we felt it was important to kind of get that message out there. And so now that if we feel like we have a common foundation um, and that owners and operators are, are having means to actually figure out if there's a leak, um, it may not necessarily be important to necessarily send it to Technical Safety BC. Does Technical Safety BC have any intention of, of moving towards periodic inspections of some sort? Um, I understand, you know, you want to ask nicely. Uh, it is the owner's responsibility. That, that doesn't always work. So we do conduct periodic assessments now of the sites. If that's your question. Yeah, that is yeah, that is my question. I'm from I'm from Ontario. I actually right. worked for the safety authority there before yeah. coming out to BC. Um, they still conduct periodic assess or periodic inspections based on a risk assessment. Um, and and TSSA really has moved towards a, a sort of a liaison and 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 information education sort of role, which which is I, I found very helpful. Um, owners found very helpful. I don't I don't believe TSBC does that at this point, but I'm curious. Curious. Uh, well, we do conduct assessments. Like we do conduct assessments on operating equipment, um, also on a risk-based perspective as well. So that that is occurring, okay. absolutely. And uh, we do direct our resources in where areas we think there are, um, you know, that we need to oversee. And so, obviously, after the Fernie incident itself, we we did go out and uh, basically conduct assessments across all ice rinks and arenas. Um, and then the next phase is that we are going to go out further uh, to look at all refrigeration systems in the province beyond ice rinks and arenas as well. We, we do also offer tech talks. Education is a big part of our organization. Okay. So um, you offer uh, learning events for contractors and mechanics and asset owners and, and as well as uh, information newsletters with a lot of safety and for me technical safety newsletters um, for for everyone in, in every technology that we oversee. Okay. We had a bit of an expansion on the um, the worry about the B-52 conflicting with the recommendations and uh, he was saying it's, he doesn't have a specific example it's just more for dealing with other <coughs> province owners um, they respect the B-52 as it is current code, the recommendations of Technical Safety BC may be seen as non-binding due to the minimum standards of B-52. That's all he was That's all I have. Discussions, questions you guys want to bring up? Okay, so with that, we're going to bring um, the webinar to a close. So first, thank you for everybody for coming in the room and as also for uh, people attending online. I do want to thank my colleagues also for being on the panel. Um, and like I said, we do want to keep the conversations going. You have our contact information. Uh, people who attended will also be reaching out by email uh, with additional information. Um, and so definitely more to come. And we do want to understand the areas of opportunities and how do we best um, serve you know the refrigeration community uh, in terms of how do we actually manage some of these risks we're talking about today so thank you very much for attending